is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm your host, Mac Pritchard. I'm also the founder of Max List. It's a job board in the Pacific Northwest that helps you find a fulfilling career. Every Wednesday, I talk to a different expert about the tools you need to find the work you want. Find Your Dream Job is brought to you by Top Resume. Let Top Resume help you tell your career story. Sign up today for a free review of your resume by one of Top Resume's expert writers. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. Everybody experiences imposter syndrome. It's that feeling that you're not as talented as others or that you don't qualify for a job. Does that sound familiar? Dr. Lisa Orbe Austin is here today to talk about how imposter syndrome can affect your job search and what you can do about it. She's a licensed psychologist and executive coach, and Lisa's the co-author of the new book, Own Your Greatness, Overcome Imposter Syndrome, Beat Self-Doubt, and Succeed in Life. She joins us today from New York City. Lisa, here's where I want to start. What is imposter syndrome exactly? So imposter syndrome is a phenomenon that people experience when they have significant credentials, accomplishments, um, concrete experiences, but they have struggled to internalize them. So as a result of that, they often feel like uh, that those, those experiences are not real. They, they often believe they've come as a result of a mistake, luck, a coincidence. So oftentimes to cover that, they then overcompensate by overworking and or sometimes self-sabotage and look to, to try to cover that experience of fraudulence or incompetence that isn't actually really true. So that's the main kind of like stuff that's behind imposter syndrome. And how does it make you feel inside imposter syndrome? How do you see it affect people? What kind of feelings do they have? I mean, I think they're often feeling, they feel very insecure about their competencies, their skills, their qualifications. They often feel like they overvalue other people's skills and undervalue their own. Uh, They typically feel pretty lonely in the experience because they feel fraudulent. They're trying to hide that experience of fraudulence. So they're often not sharing the moments in which they feel incompetent. So there's often this experience of very, large experience of loneliness and and disconnection from other people's experience of them. Is it common imposter syndrome? Yeah, the research finds that about 70% of people have experienced imposter syndrome over their lifetime. So it's it's very, very common. That's a surprising statistic. Do you have a sense of why it's so common? Seven out of 10 people uh, having this experience? I think, you know, because of some of the ways in which the, it originates, I think that's why it's so common. And I think, you know, it's common because culturally we adhere to these myths about intelligence and hard work that aren't accurate. And so as a result of that, I think that's why so many people have it is because these are common ways that we're often raised to think about overwork and, and, and intelligence that, you know, that's why I think it's so common. When people hear the word syndrome, they may think it's this is a psychological disorder, but that's not the case, is it? It's it is a psychological phenomenon, but it's not a disorder. It's not a mental health issue. Um, and so, it was discovered by two psychologists in the nineteen seventies, and they are very clear the, about the fact that it's not a mental illness. It is a phenomenon. It's an experience, largely because. Um, when you have when something gets classified as a mental health disorder, it has to impair you in school functioning, social functioning, or occupational functioning. And for people who have imposter syndrome, typically they're not impaired on those domains. They're pretty successful typically, even though they don't perceive themselves as such, they are pretty successful and can function quite well. And that's surprising to hear because uh, you would think that people who enjoy success wouldn't have this experience. Why does that happen? It's it's funny the way that you phrase it, because I don't think they really enjoy their success. (laughs) They often are very petrified by success because the success feels very precarious. Um, So even though they have these accolades and and accomplishments, credentials, they they, they feel that they're very, um, like I just said, precarious, that they could go away at any moment, that they weren't uh, obtained through a, a legitimate you know, fashion. So they feel oftentimes that they could be just, they just spare at any moment. So as a result of that fragilizing of their accomplishments, there's this experience that, you know, one, one false move, one slip and it's all over. Um, and so it, it definitely creates a sense of, um, uh, fear about accomplishment and winning and success. That's a remarkable image. I mean, people are 
it's as if people are walking on a tightrope, isn't it, when they have this experience? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And they feel like the only person that can control that tightrope is them. And they, the way that they control it is by over-functioning. Well, what causes imposter syndrome, Lisa? So most of the research sort of points to the fact that these experiences of imposter syndrome come from early childhood experiences of either being seen in, in one of two ways, and then we have kind of classified a third way that we've seen in our practice. But the, the first way is, is that you were, when you grew up, you were thought of as the smart one. So you were the one who was really naturally gifted, smart, intelligent, but that meant that, that things just came easily to you. So it didn't require any work on your part. Um, and so every time you've ever had to work, it's meant that that, was, that particular image of you isn't true because people who are naturally gifted, smart, intelligent don't need to work. And the second way is that you weren't considered the smart one, but you were considered the one who works hard. So you get the things in your life as a result of working really, really hard, not because you have any natural skills or talents or gifts. And I think what these two particular kind of dichotomies sort of set up is this idea that if you're smart, you don't work hard. If you work hard, you have to do it because you're not smart. And actually, to be successful, you have to have both. You have to have natural skills, abilities, talents, and you have to work hard, Um, that these things actually coincide together, that they are not separate and paradoxical experiences. And I think the third way that, that we have identified in our practice was people who didn't have either of these experiences because they grew up in places in which they had to survive. And so for the third group, we see people who weren't thought of as smart or hardworking because nobody was really paying attention to them um, because they were neglected by adult figures or there wasn't any kind of adult figures there to kind of give them those 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 pieces of feedback. So they've just learned to survive. So even when they're successful, they don't see it as like as a result of skill or talent. They just see it as like, we're just trying to get along. I'm just trying to survive. Um, even when they're, they're far beyond survival. When you talked about the first group, I was reminded of uh, the book by Kara Dweck, a psychologist mm-hmm. who I think is at Stanford now, yep. called Mindset. And yep. she talked about people who enjoy uh, early success in, in life, uh, especially in high school or college. And it, they're afraid to take risks because uh, success has come to them early uh, and they yep. don't want to jeopardize that success. Is that related to imposter syndrome as well or is that an entirely different issue? Actually, we talk about Carol Dweck in our book because we feel like the experiences are quite related because this ex- of this idea of um, like a fixed experience that, you know, not this idea of like what she calls the growth mindset and this idea that when you fail, you can learn from it. When people fail who have imposter syndrome, they feel exposed by it. They feel like, oh, see, now you see all the ways in which I'm flawed as opposed to, oh, here's an opportunity for me to actually get something to the from this to actually be able to you know, grow and get bigger and to, to be able to do more. It's a very different experience. And so what we're talking about in the book is often encouraging people to kind of lean toward more of a growth mindset perspective than a fixed mindset perspective or, or a fixed quality perspective. And this idea that you then with mistakes, you learn and grow and, and, and expand as opposed to contract and fear and feel like it's dangerous. Um, so yes, they are very connected concepts around you know, fixed versus fluid and flexible. I want to talk more about how to overcome imposter syndrome, particularly in a job search. But before we move on to that, I want to talk about gender. Is, is there, does imposter syndrome affect both men and women equally? Well, the, inter- the interesting piece on that is that the research is very, um, it's very controversial. It's back and forth. So one study will find that it is true. The next study will find that it isn't true. So there's not a conclusive finding regarding gender, but there has been some interesting kind of research to suggest that men and women may approach it very differently. So what they find pretty consistently with men, and this is clearly not always true, but generally true, that men tend to want to engage in saving face when they have imposter syndrome. And so as a result, they'll put themselves in situations where they know that they will succeed because they will be with lesser peers or have lesser competition because they want to make sure that they still rise to the top, where women will put themselves in positions of risk and try things um, and, and face a constant battle with that imposter syndrome because they are in places that are very competitive and facing, you know, uh, this idea that they could be fraudulent um, uh, more consistently. They, so they'll take the greater risk um, where men will t- sort of 
get caught in places where they're lacking opportunities for advancement and, and growth because they're trying to make sure that they're top of the game. Interesting difference. Well, let's talk about job search. Uh, how do you see imposter syndrome affect people who are, are doing a job search? So there's a couple of ways that I've seen it um, show up for, for job search. I think, you know, one of the key ways is that oftentimes people with imposter syndrome find themselves getting stuck at a job because they often feel like they'll be inadequate for other roles. So they often perceive like, this is the best I can do. Like, I'm not sure anybody else would be interested in my skills or I'm not sure I'll be competitive in the market. So they often stay in roles too long um, because they are concerned about their viability in the marketplace because they don't trust their, their qualifications. Um, they can also be very perfectionistic about what they think they're qualified for. So because their perfection is one of the underlying components of imposter syndrome, if, if a job spec is not 100%, they don't fit it at 100%, they won't bother applying for it. Or if they feel like they don't have almost everything, as opposed to considering, well, if I have 50 or 60% of it, I should give it a shot. Um, they really want to make sure that they have everything. Um, I think another thing that can show up is... There's a, there's a significant piece of performance anxiety that goes on for people with imposter syndrome. So we were talking earlier about like self-sabotage. And so I often see it show up around not preparing for interviews or not preparing for the process because the performance anxiety about interviewing can be so intense because there's such a concern they're going to screw up or not be able to kind of sell themselves appropriately so they don't prep. Um, so I see that. I think I also see this experience of not reaching out to their network because they, they are often, impost, people who are, have imposter syndrome are often the go-tos. They, they're the people that people actually go to for help because they're so competent and skilled. But they don't like you know, having to rely or need others in the process, so they can often skip the part of, ne- of networking. So those are some of the common ways I think can show up in a job search. Okay, so avoiding risk-taking, not asking mm-hmm. others for help, and not doing self-sabotage, uh, not doing the preparation that uh, might help them actually get an offer after a yeah. job interview. Well, I want to dig into each of those areas. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Dr. Lisa Orby Austin about imposter syndrome and how to overcome it in your job search. When you suffer from imposter syndrome, you undersell yourself. Not only where you choose to apply or in job interviews, but in your resume too. Are you doing the best you can describing your accomplishments in your resume? Find out today. Sign up for a free resume review by our show's sponsor, Top Resume. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. One of Top Resume's expert writers will give you personal feedback for free no strings attached. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. You'll learn if your resume's format shows the difference you made for past employers, you'll get a detailed breakdown of your resume's weaknesses, and you'll receive practical, actionable advice about how to fix what's wrong. And don't worry if you have a tight application deadline. A top resume writer will send you your personal report in 48 hours or less. Stop selling yourself short in your resume and your job search. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. Now, let's get back to the show. We're back in the MaxList studio. I'm talking with Dr. Lisa Orbe Austin. She's a licensed psychologist and executive coach. And Lisa is the co-author of the new book, Own Your Greatness, Overcome Imposter Syndrome, Beat Self-Doubt, and Succeed in Life. Lisa, in our first segment, we talked about imposter syndrome, what it is, uh, why it happens, and who it affects, and, and how it can shape a job search. And you made three points just before we took the break about um, uh, how we, imposter syndrome can influence Uh, a job search. The first one I want to dig into is your point about uh, not taking risks uh, and aiming for jobs for which you might not have 100% of the qualifications. What advice would you give someone who's in that situation? How do you see people overcome that? I mean, I think it's, it's, it's layered, but I think some of the things that people can do to kind of really concretely avoid that are working on internalizing their accomplishments by cataloging them and, you know, generating examples of their accomplishments, which I think is also just a helpful process to 
to actually prepping for the interview process, but also um, having an accountability partner because often they don't trust their own evaluations of their work. But if they have somebody that in their lives that they know that they can trust an, uh, their honest evaluation of their skills and abilities, then they can sort of do this in partnership with them to kind of start to list out all the skills and abilities that they do have that would be bi- very viable in the marketplace. Um, I think another piece is sort of learning to apply for things that aren't perfect fits that, that very rarely are you a perfect fit for a job. Like when someone develops a spec, they're looking for this, this magical ideal candidate and they know they're not going to get 100% of everything. And so it's really also allowing yourself to apply for things that you, know, that you see that you have some, most of the qualifications for like 60% or so, and then applying for those uh, and applying with that in mind. Like you don't apply with this... Um, uh, like mentality of like all the things I don't have, you probably with this mentality of like, these are the things that I do have. This is what I can offer. Um, I think the other piece is like divesting energy from toxic situations or difficult, you know, work situations. And so oftentimes, you, you know, people in the post don't get caught up with trying to fix the situation. And it's like, you've got to take some of that energy and focus it instead on your search and on your process. So sometimes in my, pra- in my practice, I'll tell a client, well, before you, um, bent about that particular situation at work, you owe yourself 25 minutes of job search work and then you can vent. Um, just to kind of get in the habit of, 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 of giving to yourself first before you use your energy to reinvest in a toxic or, or negative situation, um, but finding ways to invest in yourself. I'm glad you brought up that percentage of uh, desired qualifications. I think you said 60%. I hear that number consistently in interviews on this show, both from yeah. recruiters, career coaches, and hiring managers. Uh, and I'm always surprised uh, that uh, that people wrestle with that. Uh, so thank you for making that point. Let's yeah. talk about self-sabotage. Uh, how can... You mentioned that some people will get interviews and they're so anxious about uh, doing well or, or, or perhaps uh, their anxiety leads them to not prepare and then they don't get the position. How do you see people overcome that kind of self-sabotage? I think you have to structure your preparation, right? You have to have a routine for how you prepare for interviews. And so if you structure and there's always what you, this is what you do. You, five days out from the interview, you do this, you do that. You know, you create a structure so there isn't a choice. Because when you have anxiety, you're never going to feel the desire to prep for the interview. Um, you're always going to want to avoid it because that's a natural tendency when you have anxiety is to, to avoid the stimulus of the anxiety. So I think it's really important to have a structure and to engage the structure and stick to the routine around the structure um, and have like a plan for how you typically prepare for an interview process and, and you don't have choices about it. It's embedded into your schedule about how you're going to prepare for the interview and every day you have a different task related to the prep of it. But I do think it's like not giving yourself choices around it and knowing that this is the responsible thing to do is to set up a structure to prepare for that process. What do you recommend if the phone rings and it's a recruiter and she wants to talk to you right now and you haven't had the structure and the, and the schedule to, to do those sorts of things? I think, you know, I'm always, I always tell my clients, like, don't pick up the phone, like immediately, you know, like, cause you can get caught off guard and be in a situation where you don't, you can't really talk, but then you engage in a conversation you're not prepped to have. And so I do always say like, if, you know, if you don't recognize the number, don't pick it up, take the, you know, take the message and then call back when you're in a quiet place, when you're prepared, you've done some, even if it's a smaller amount of preparation, you've done some prep to have the call is it can just be a disaster to kind of just get into an impromptu conversation immediately. And I imagine the process that you lay out can be uh, trans can translate into a compressed schedule. So if you do get the call and the interview is tomorrow, uh, you still have yeah. a, some steps you can follow, don't you? Yes, absolutely. You're kind of wanting to be somewhat flexible in, in the way that you do it, but you know, so you know, a lot of my what I do with a lot of my clients is I have these like standard inter- interview questions that I make them kind of like develop cards or or documents around, and then they go to study them. And so they engage in a studying process for the the common questions, the the behavioral questions, they have have things that they're looking at around that, and then the the questions that are asked, um, that they'll ask the the interviewer. So they always have these kinds of three-pronged process. So you can always condense that into something shorter, but you definitely want to be prepped with, with, you know, a basic plan for how you're going to approach this. The third point you made about how imposter syndrome affects job search in our first segment was that people are often reluctant to ask others for help or to leverage uh, their network. How do you recommend people work with their networks if if they're reluctant to do that? 
I'm always like a big proponent in what I call relational networking. I'm, I, you know, a lot of people who have imposter syndrome are always like, I don't want to, you know, ask somebody for something when I haven't talked to them in a while. It just feels like I'm just taking and not giving. But if you engage in relational networking, which is sort of this experience of like, look, we're building professional community together. And, you know, I'm going to give to you in whatever ways I can add value and, and you may give to me in some way. But the idea is we're building a relationship that's going to last a long time. At least that's the idea behind it. Um, it may or may not, but the idea that you're building community around you. And so, yes, this time you may be asking for something. Next time they may be asking for something. But if you engage in a relational way and you do your homework about them, you get to know them before you even even reach out to them, that you sort of give yourself this opportunity to kind of think of that relationship in a much less transactional way that I think makes people with imposter syndrome very fearful around sort of being rejected. But, and I think I oftentimes also encourage people to recognize that generally people are receptive to this. And the worst thing that will happen is that you won't hear anything. Um, not that they'll kind of be outraged that you could even reach out to them, which is, I think is the fear. Um, that people are often really kind, but you've got to step your foot you know, got to put your foot in the water first to recognize that they are. Um, and I think oftentimes that gives them the momentum to keep going on when they've had a good conversation. They're like, oh, that was really good. And I, I learned this and that and the other thing. And then you're like, yes, this is what it can be like if you think of it as much more relational. We haven't talked about money yet. I, how does imposter syndrome affect salary negotiations? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I do think that's also a piece of it, which is that I, I think that, you know, when you have imposter syndrome, you're much more reluctant to negotiate because you just feel like you should just be happy for the opportunity that they've given you like a gift because you don't necessarily feel like you deserve it. And so I do think like one of the things you can do is is clearly you always want to prepare for your negotiation and keep a win-win perspective around it. Like, you know, not this kind of win-lose or adversarial perspective that I think kind of creates a really threatening environment that imposter, people with imposter syndrome are very fearful of. It's, it's going to be thought of as like, you know, everyone's winning in this circumstance. You know, they're going to get a really happy employee. They're going to get someone who feels really kind of valued and you're going to get whatever compensation you need to kind of you know, take it to the next place. And so I do think it's really kind of changing the mindset around like the process of negotiating. Like oftentimes I hear, you know, people say, well, what if they pull the offer? It happens so rarely. You know, the experience is often people, people expect a negotiation. I mean, you want to be prepared and not say something that's off, like just random and off the charts. And so they don't think that you're not prepared for it. But if you're prepared, it's, it's pretty standard course. So you've, you've shared some very practical steps that uh, people can take to overcome imposter syndrome. In your work with your clients, uh, Lisa, how long typically do you see that it takes for people to act on these ideas and and see benefits? It's a great question. I think it varies. It really varies on the person. It really depends on how much um, investment they make in the process. And for some people, the experience is much more layered. Um, They have other things that are also getting in the way of them succeeding and kind of um, taking care of themselves in these ways. But I think, you know, what's important is that, that if you're invested in making a change, there are concrete things you can do to move the needle and you can move it pretty quickly, but you have to kind of really work to kind of, in essence, regroove your mindset around um, the way that you see and internalize your strengths and accomplishments and the way you see community and the way that you even process, you know, failure. There's a lot of things to work on, but I think it's it's concrete, the things you can do to make the the, the make things shift. And is this work that you can do on your own or do you recommend working with others to, uh, again, address the issues that come from imposter syndrome that can affect your job search? I think, that, well, I believe it's work you can do on your own. I don't think you necessarily, you can also see somebody who actually specializes and also get support. There's no harm in that. But if you wanted to do it on your own, I think it's possible. Actually, our book is actually a workbook. So it is actually the step-by-step process of actually managing and kind of pivoting your, your imposter syndrome in another direction. So we do believe that you can do it on your own. Um, and, but you can also get support. Either We also support that very, very, um, very strongly. Well, it's been a terrific conversation. Uh, tell us, Lisa, what's next for you? Well, um, the book comes out um, on April 28th. Um, and so I guess that's the next thing that will be coming out for us. And I think we'll, be, we'll also be doing a companion course to go along with the book for people who want to kind of have a community around them to work on the book in a structured format. I know people could learn more about your new book as well as your other services by visiting your website and that address is dynamic transitions, We'll be sure to include that URL in the show notes. 
Now, Lisa, given all the great advice you've shared today, what's the one thing you want a listener to remember about how to overcome imposter syndrome in a job search? I I think the one thing that I want people to walk away with is that you can change the process, even if you felt like it's always been the same and there's no other way to do it except for this painful, difficult way of doubting yourself and kind of being just grateful for what you get. There is a way to shift the dynamic, but it just does take a commitment to kind of shifting some of the negative ways in which you've engaged your, with yourself before, but it, but there, it is possible to kind of move the needle and get a better experience in the future. Use the application process to find out if you've got a good resume or not. Talk to one of the experts at Top Resume today. It's free. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. And if you like this podcast, sign up for our free weekly newsletter. You'll get links to our guest books and websites, a transcript for every episode, and other resources too. Go to maxlist.org slash podcasts. Again, that's maxlist.org slash podcasts. Next week, our guest will be Meg Gary. She's a certified career coach and co-host to the podcast, All Things College and Career. One of the biggest challenges you face in your career is how to choose the field you want to work in. Meg and I will talk about why it's important to narrow your career choices and how to do it. Whether you're a recent college graduate or considering a mid-career change, I hope you'll join us. Until next time, thanks for letting us help you find your dream job.